Um, uh, okay, uh, welcome everybody to a new session of our category seminar. Today we have the pleasure and honor um, of having Julia Plavnik from India University of Bloomington. She will be talking to us about her work on how to test your modular categories. Before starting, if anyone wishes to ask a question during the talk, please unmute yourself or ask uh, the question in the chat. If you don't feel comfortable asking your question in English, please ask in Spanish and then we'll be very happy to translate for Julia. The students are especially encouraged to ask questions. Please, Julia, take it away and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak at Seminario de Categorías. Uh, it's an honor for me. So I will tell you a little bit about a construction that we developed with some of my collaborators, uh, Colin Delani, Cesar Galindo, Eric Rowell, and Ching Sang. And the name of this construction is Cesting. The idea is that we want to uh, start with a modular category and add a little bit of flavor to get a new modular category out of it. That's why this name is here, uh, not my creation. It's Eric's creative side, the name of the construction. And then uh, if time allows, I will tell you a little bit about some properties that we studied with Colin Delany and Sang Kim uh, some summers ago about this construction and how this relates with links and nodes invariants. Again, feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, with questions, unmute yourself, and yeah, I can answer also in Spanish, so feel free to do so. So I know that Eric already told you a lot about modular categories. I will just uh, mention a couple of things again. So for me, this notation MTC, it's just modular tensor category. And before going into a um, very specific construction of them, I wanted to tell you why we like these modular categories. And particularly, I really like studying modular categories because they are related to many areas of mathematics from analysis point of view, coming from C-star algebras, von Neumann algebras, uh, subfactor theory, uh, mathematical physics, so the representation of vertex operator algebras or conformal field theories, all of them are related with uh, modular tensor categories. From the algebraic point of view, also this is very interesting. That's how I started studying these modular categories. I, I was studying during my PhD Hof algebras in Argentina. We have a big school about Hof algebras and the representation theory of certain uh, Hof algebras give you modular tensor categories. In general, they give you tensor categories, but sometimes modular ones. Quantum groups are of interest in, or are related to modular categories and also low dimensional topology, uh, links and not invariants, TQFT, all these things are related and maybe I'm forgetting about many of them. And also they appear uh, in physics, modular uh, tensor categories are a model for certain specific topological phases of matter and that makes them useful or at least uh, hopefully useful for topological quantum computing. And the other thing that I like to think about is like, uh, like groups are the natural hosts for classical symmetries, but when we're studying some quantum objects now, uh, the groups are, or groups are not enough to, or not longer enough to describe their symmetries. And seems like tensor categories are the unifying language to study these quantum symmetries or these symmetries of quantum objects. So these are some of the, th the, the reasons why I like studying modular tensor categories or tensor categories in general. But let me tell you a little bit more about them. This field is a very young field. So we are in the early stages of studying uh, modular categories. And maybe if you have been in Eric's talk, you, you hear how far we are in the classification or you hear what kind of things we are doing. So like, if you would like to think on a parallel <laughs> with groups, we're in the very, very early stages. We have this <laughs> goal of classifying modular categories given different invariants, and usually we classify small uh, modular categories. One of the invariants is the rank, which is the number of simple objects, and I will talk a little bit more about this uh, later again. And we're in the very like early, early stages. Like in March, there is, it has been posted this paper classifying rank C 
six. So if you want to think of an analogy, it's like we're in order six for groups. It's not exactly like this, but one idea of an analogy. So it's a very young uh, field. So one of the things that we are lacking is of examples. Most of the examples that we know at the moment come from quantum groups, categories, categories that uh, I will mention a little bit about them. And I think Eric also mentioned a little bit about them that can be constructed from a simple Lie algebra. Um, and the other thing that we do is we have these basic examples and then we apply certain constructions and that's the way that we get more examples, but we don't know anything more exotic than that at the moment, at least, or that what we, we know. So some problems that I like to think about is classification problems of modular categories or fusion categories or tensor categories. I was saying, we look at different invariants, the dimension, the rank, other kind of Frobenius Perron dimension uh, and other things like this. And we try to classify, we try to make a, a list of the modular categories that satisfies certain property with respect to that invariant. Other thing that I like to understand are properties that these categories have or invariants. So if you give me a, a modular category, I would like to associate to it different numbers or different invariants, matrices or numbers or things like this, that uh, if you have different invariants of, uh, if you have two categories with different of these numbers or matrices or so on, you know that the categories are not equivalent. So that are invariants. Usually they are not complete invariants. So you could have categories with the same of these invariants and still they will not be equivalent, but still this help us to, uh, to understand them better. And the other thing, and the one that I will focus today is that I like to think about construction. So as I was saying, we don't have many examples. One way to get new examples is like getting a new construction and trying to get something interesting out of it. So testing, it's one of these constructions that we have. Uh, and I will talk about this expli explicit construction. So let me tell you a little bit more about testing. I want to tell you a little bit about the history and motivation. So we started thinking about testing a long, long time ago. Uh, actually, it's like 10 years ago, we meet in, in Ames, in the American Institute of Mathematics for a workshop about fusion categories and subfactor. And one of the groups was studying classification of modular categories of certain dimension. Frobenius Perron dimension. This was an interesting dimension because we knew that not everything here comes from groups, like finite groups. Uh, and what happened is that we studied the growth and decreeing of these modular categories, and we could find that there were there was a rank 10 fusion ring or growth and decreeing that was a little bit different of the ones that we knew. It was similar to one that we know that it's the one of SU3 level three, but it was not the same. It was very similar, but not the same. And that's the first time uh, in which we saw the testing construction. So what we were able to do is we were able to obtain this uh, fusion ring. So these fusion rules uh, can be obtained by the ones that we know, the ones from um, SU3 level three by twisting uh, this uh, tensor product that we have by an invertible. And it's okay uh, if you don't know these words, I will say more, it's just, I want to give an idea. So what we did is we deformed a little bit our original product, uh, our original tensor product by something kind of very small and very kind of easy to, ma to manage. And we obtained the exotic one, the new, the new exotic uh, fusion ring. So that was the first time that we did this. Uh, and this is joint work with a lot of people in that, in, in that workshop. The second time that testing appeared uh, was when we were studying a property of modular categories. So, there is this notion of modular category, and there is another notion of something called supermodular categories. And the difference is that when you look at what elements are transparent for the braiding, in the case of modular, the only simple uh, or, or, 
or the, the category of elements transparent for the braiding is vector spaces. So it's as trivial as you can wish. In super modular, and maybe this super is a hint, instead of asking that, we will ask that this uh, category of transparent objects is the category of super vector spaces. So it's a little bit uh, more degenerate than modular categories, but not very degenerate. It's a slightly degenerate kind of categories. And there was a conjecture that uh, Michael Muger posted that he says that every supermodular category always admit a minimal modular closure. What this means is that there exists another category that it's modular that contains my supermodular, but it, it is not very big. It's just uh, twice of the dimension of this supermodular. So that's the minimal thing, the maybe there is a restriction on the dimension. So if my supermodular is B, I want to have B included in some B tilde, but the dimensions will be very controlled. Why there is a two here is not, not like a choice, is because of the dimension of super vector spaces, maybe let me say here. This two comes from the dimension of this category of super vector spaces is two. So that's why this two is appearing. We want to have certain control of the category and basically it's related with the size of the degeneracy of the category. So there was this conjecture um, about minimal modular extensions and what was proved by, or this conjecture was, uh, was approached by different people like there is work of Davidov, uh, Mugger, Nikshik, and Ostrich, work of uh, Kong, Lian, and Wen, and, and work of myself with my collaborators, Paul Brulliard, uh, Richard Ng, Cesar Galindo, Eric Rowell, Shenhan Wang, Tobias Ag. Many people work on this idea of the conjecture. And different people was able to prove different things. One of the things that we could prove was that if you have one minimal modular extension, there are always, sorry, there exist 16 of them. Uh, so if, if I know that there is one, I know that there are 16 of them. And let me say before saying what's the relation with testing, let me tell you that actually this conjecture was proved when you drop the, the condition of, prim, of having a pivot or a ribbon structure. So when we are in the non-degenerate and slightly degenerate world, so we're, we're kind of dropping the traces for now, but uh, uh, Theo Johnson Frey and David Reuter, they prove it maybe in 2021 or 2020, prove the conjecture. So it's true that if you are in the super modular case, you have always a minimal modular extension. And in this case, there are 16 of them. So this conjecture, it's if you drop this super modular, it's not true. There are examples of symmetric categories that don't admit a minimal modular extension. And this 16 is also something in this super setting. And why testing was interesting, what we did with my collaborators in this paper was showing that actually, if you give me one minimal modular extension, I can get an orbit of eight minimal modular extensions using testing. So for example, one of the examples that we have of minimal, of super modular category, sorry, is this family of PSU2 at this nice level for M plus two. These are always super modular. This is the even part of this other example. This one is modular. This is super modular. So this in particular is a minimal modular extension, a minimal closure. What we can do when we get this is we get eight of them by testing. There is another known closure for this one that it's coming from SO to M plus one at level two, and we can get other eight in both cases by testing. And we know that the families coming from here and here are different maybe here and here are different. So that's the way that you can get 16 of them. We know this because testing preserves some properties and I will talk about this later, but these families and these families have different 
in certain invariants. The ranks are different here, they are preserved here, but the central charge varies in here and in here. So that's why we know that we get the 16 of them, exactly 16 of them. So that was other moment in which we talk about um, testing. And then other thing for which testing has been proved to be useful is categorification of modular data and fusion rules. So I will not write all the names, but in 2018, uh, Isumi and Grossman, they provided a list of a lot of modular data that are these S and T matrices, but they didn't know if these matrices actually come from a modular category. They satisfy some of all the nice properties, but they didn't know if they, it comes from a modular category or not. And then uh, Parsa Bonderson, Eric Rowell, and Shen Han Wang show that some of these examples of modular data can be realized using testing. And for fusion rules, there is some example, similar example. Uh, Liu, Palku, and Ren, they were studying different fusion rings, and they didn't know if these fusion rings actually come from a fusion category or a modular category. And uh, they, they were able to show that some of them do and use testing to do that. So that's why testing is kind of powerful. So let me review some notation before I go into the construction. I know that Eric talked a little bit about this. I will fix K to be the complex. You could think about an algebraically close of characteristic zero. Some of these hypotheses could be dropped, but for the theory that we are doing, we will use both of these. So a modular category is a category that has a lot of structures. So the first thing that I want to have is an abelian and c-linear structure. Abelian is just that I have direct sum, a zero object, kernels, co-kernels, basically that I have a exact sequences in my category. And C-linear, so this is more with this piece, and C-linear is related to the home spaces. So the idea is that the home spaces in my category are vector spaces, are C vectors, uh, complex vector spaces. In principle, they will be sets, but we are asking that they are complex vector spaces. That's where the field is important. Monoidal, I will ask not only to have this abelian or this additive structure, but I also want to have a tensor product. So we have a tensor product, I will have an associativity constraint because now when we are in categories, equality is too strong to require. So instead of asking that this tensor product is um, associative in the nose, we will ask that there is a naturalized isomorphism realizing this, this associativity that I can change parentheses from left to right. I will have a distinguished object in my category, the one that will be the unit for this tensor product. And again, saying that it's the unit is that X tensor one is X basically, and the same in the other side, but I cannot say this with equality. So I will ask left and right unit or morphism saying that X tensor one is isomorphic to X and one tensor X is isomorphic to X. That's kind of what we are doing here. And here we need two things. One is that all these things are compatible with things here. So I will ask that this factor is exact, that it's bilinear in morphisms and things like this. And also I will ask for a coherence axiom that it's called the Pentagon axiom and another axiom that it's called the triangle axiom. This is telling you about associativity L and R and how they are related. And this one, this is a pentagon because if you give me four objects, there are five ways to put parentheses on this. I put that in the vertices and then here I will complete with possible associativities and identities. And I'm saying that you can do it in whichever way you want, that this diagram will be commutative. So rigidity, this will be the existence of duals in my categories. But in my category, the existence of the dual is a little bit more uh, subtle, I need to have another object that it's X dual, and I need to have an evaluation map that if you think it's very similar to what we would like to have in vector spaces, and a co-evaluation map satisfying something called zigzag axioms. And for example, if you think on vector spaces, the category of vector spaces is a tensor, it's a mono abelian monoidal 
category, but to be rigid to this co-evaluation exists and satisfy the six axioms, the dimension of your vector spaces need to be finite. So that's kind of a finiteness condition that I will be adding. Semi-simple means that every uh, object can be decomposed as a direct sum of simples, and this sum need to be finite. I always want finite sums. And what it's a simple is the simple in the sense of an abelian category. My object cannot have any tri any non-trivial subobject. The only subobjects that a simple object admit are zero, the zero object here, and the object itself. So if you are thinking, of, for example, on the case of uh, representations of a group, for example, the simples are the irreducible representations or the simple representations. I will ask for a finiteness condition, and this is the, the number of simples. And here always up to isomorphisms. I don't really care about the simple itself. I care about the isomorphism classes. I will ask that I have finite, finitely many of them. And then I will ask for a little bit more. All this here, it's a fusion category up to here. Sorry, and I forgot one condition that it's not fitting here. I will also ask that my nice distinguished object, the, the, the one, the unit, it's a simple in the category. So all this is a fusion category. And examples of a fusion category, for example, are representations of a group, of a finite group over the complex, finite dimensional representations of a group over the complex. So that will be an example. Now, what it's braided? Braided is an idea of commutativity. I would like to have that my tensor product is commutative. This is given by the braid morphism, but it's not just that it's commutative. It needs to be commutative in a coherent way. And when I say coherent way, I mean with the monoidal structure. So maybe let me add one thing here. Imagine that if you have the tensor product, you would like to know how this tensor product behaves with respect to the braid. What happens if I do this? And so the idea is compare this with this. If I can obtain this map using these maps, and the answer is yes. And what you have, the hexagons, sorry, I didn't do an hexagon, but the hexagon axioms, uh, is like a braid equation. Why I have so many things, why I have an hexagon and not a triangle if it's kind of the braid equation, basically, because I will need to use the associativity here. And that associativity will appear and will give me other of the sides. If my category is what we call a strict, we, in which this, this, and this are trivial, are the identity, in that case is the braid equation. So for a strict. And I have two hexagons because I want to have the tensor product in this side or in this side. And in both sides, I want this to be coherent. I want to have the braid equation in both sides, basically. The ribbon structure that I will ask now is the existence of something called a twist, which is an isomorphism, uh, isomorphism sorry, between X and itself. This isomorphism, again, need to behave nicely with the braid and the tensor product. So what I will ask is what happens if I do this? The dream maybe would be that this is a tensor thing and that it's kind of respect the product, but it's not true. We ask this almost is, and here what I will do is I will play with the braid. Uh, so I will ask for this equation and for another equation that it's related with the dual. Basically, it's telling me that I can construct the twist for the dual object using the twist of the original object. I will not say much more about this, but what it is important about the ribbon structure, let me see if I can move this without destroying everything. What it's nice about the ribbon structure is that give us traces uh, in, in the category. So that will be important when we define links and not invariants attached to the modular category. And the last thing is that it's non-degenerate, that it's all this thing that I was talking about 
objects that are transparent for the braiding. So let me go to this auxiliary for one second. So I will use what we call graphical calculus. If I grade my objects next to each other, I will mean that this is the tensor product, but I will start avoiding writing this. And so the braid, if you remember, is a map that goes like this. So how I will draw my braid, hopefully I will be coherent, something like this. So when we do uh, the square of the braiding that already appeared when I was writing the twist equation, what I, I'm doing is basically this. And a fair question is asking when this is the identity of X tensor Y, when this is, if it's or not. That's a fair question. If, if it is, we said that X and Y centralize each other and we want to measure that. We want to measure that. So I will collect all the X in C such that the square of the braiding the one that I just draw is equal to the identity for every y in C. And to say that it's non-degenerate, it's to say that this category is small, as small as possible, as I was saying before, meaning that this category is the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. So non-degenerate means here this. So means that the only simple here that, that centralize any other object is the unit. That's what we are saying. So that's the definition of a modular category. Now let me fix a little bit of notation. So some invariants that we like are the irreducible objects, which are just the set of simple objects up to isomorphisms. And if you remember, this is a finite set. The one is always there. Uh, so I'm writing it like this. The number of simple objects is also important and it's called the rank. So maybe I will add that here. I don't know if I will use it, but the rank of the category is just the number of irreducible objects or simples or isomorphism classes of simples, which is this R. There is another interesting class of objects. Simples, I already told you what it means, but I told you that invertibles will be playing an important role. I say that when we says we deform using the invertibles, what means to be invertible? Means that this object has an inverse for the tensor product. And who is the inverse must be the dual. And actually the the way to realize this isomorphism is via the evaluation and the co-evaluation. That's the way that we do it. So what we look is we look at the set of isomorphism classes of the invertibles. That set is a group under the tensor product. Other set that we could look is at all the invertibles. Now we will drop this thing and I will use both. That's why I'm mentioning both. Other important thing is the fusion rules that I already talked about a little bit, or at least I mentioned that it's one of the things that we want to change. So what we do is the following. If you give me two objects, uh, I could tensor them. And let me change a little bit the notation just to follow with the simples. This, you could do it with any element. I will do it with simples. You can tensor two simples in your category because it's monoidal. But now you get a new object in the category. This category is semi-simple. So I can decompose this object as a sum of simples again. But maybe these simples appear with certain multiplicity. So that nijk is just the number of times that, maybe let me change, the number of times that the isomorphism class of xk appears in this tensor product. And these are called the fusion rules. And actually something that we could look is we could look at the matrix of left multiplication by an object. And if you want, let me do XI here so it's slightly easier. And if I, I think about this in the growth and the green, these are a basis of the growth and the green. So I could look at the matrix. I could get the matrix out of these, the matrix. 
and what is the matrix? Here I would, if I want to see how looks the column J, I will plug in XJ here, and then I will see what it's to, to see what it's the element in the Kth row, I will look at this. So my matrix is actually this an I matrix that has entries. Or maybe I say it, uh, hopefully I didn't say it, transpose. It's this or the transpose, maybe I did correct. What it's interesting is that these elements are just multiplicity. So these are natural numbers or zero, right? So by frobenius perron theorem, this matrix that has all non-negative integers admits or has a maximal non-negative eigenvalue. And that uh, element, that eigenvalue, will be the dimension, the frobenius perron dimension of my element. Something nice about this frobenius perron dimension, maybe a remark, is that x is invertible if and only if the frobenius perron dimension of x is one. This frobenius perron dimension is always a, a non-negative real number. And if you are with the simples, it's always positive. It's actually a multiplicative, the frobenius perron dimension is multiplicative, additive, unital, and behaves well with dual. So it's a very nice invariant. These are all very nice invariants. So let me tell you a little bit more about invariants that we will care in this talk. And uh, But again, if you have questions about what I have just described, all these invariants here, they don't use modular, they just use fusion category. The ones that I will introduce next, it will be more related with the pre-modular structure and the modular one. Any questions so far? Uh, Julia, uh, well, yes. yes uh, for example, if you take uh, the the G graded vector spaces, this is a modular uh, modular category, no? So, could you please uh, uh, maybe say why the, in in group theory is the Frobenius wrong dimension and yeah. the wrong and so if you take this example of the G, this will be a fusion category. And we can even deform this using an omega. That omega will be a three cos cycle, maybe here. And this will deform the associativity. So in this case, this is a very interesting example of fusion categories because if you think about the uh, objects, these are just sorry, these are just uh, vector spaces graded by the group G. So these are subspaces. And th this always is finite dimensional for us because otherwise we will not have duals. So who will be the simple object here? The simple objects will be the one dimensional vector spaces because it's like the category of vector spaces, but now we have this extra thing that it's degrading. So the simples will be these ones that I need to tell you. So this will be one dimensional uh, C vector space concentrated in degree G. What I mean is when I look at this, if I would look at the, gra the grading in this case, so I need to see who is the component H and this will be always zero unless I'm in the G component and in that component is C. The frobenius perron dimension of this will be just one. They are all invertibles. And the dual actually is looking at this one. And something interesting about this example is that the fusion rules here are given, or the tensor product is the convolution product that can be written, but it's very easy to see what is the tensor product in, in this in the simples, and then you can extend by linearity. And the tensor product in the simple, imagine that I'm tensoring something, a, a vector space of dimension one and another of dimension one. So I still get the dimension one vector space. And what will happen is that now it's concentrated in degree GH. So this example here behaves like the, the or the fusion ring is exactly the group algebra. So these are the simples, but if you give me any V here, 
The Fermi spiral dimension is just the underlying dimension as a vector space. And actually, this is more generally true. So if you have rep G, or if you know what the Hof algebra is, and you have, so this is a Hof algebra. In here, the Frobenius Sperron dimension coincides with the dimension of vector spaces. All these representations have vector spaces underlying, also these ones. And in that case, the vector space dimension coincides with the Frobenius Sperron dimension. But there are other categories, and I will give examples in a little bit, that have provenance per own dimension some more crazy numbers. Uh, and I will give you an example. But in the ones that have vector spaces underlying, the dimension coincide. I don't know if that helps. Oh, it helps. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. So let me tell you about the modular data. To define the modular data, I need to tell you a little bit about the trace. I don't want to talk much about the trace, but basically, if you give me an endomorphism of an object, I will be able to give you back a number, meaning that I will be able to write kind of a, or I will be able to have a trace that satisfies the things that we like about the trace. So how we create the trace, uh, we need to use evaluation and co-evaluation maps, but not only that, I will use something called the pivotal structure. And I will not talk about this, but this is maybe related to this twist. Can be, so there is, if I have a twist, I can define a, a pivotal structure using the twist and vice versa. Uh, and actually, I want this trace to behave very nice. So this a pivotal structure comes from the twist. But if my twist is what I said, ribbon, that behaves well with the duals, this pivotal structure is something called spherical. So it didn't matter if I close the loop in this side or in this side. That's the spherical, that you can move the trace around. Like if you imagine that you have an sphere and you move this around, this, this thing here. So you could trace it in any of the two sides, basically. So the T matrix, let me tell you about the T matrix. And I'm coming back again to this twist. The T matrix will be a diagonal matrix. And it will have the twist information basically on it. So what I want to say is that in abelian categories, we have something a, or a version of Schur's lemma. So what happened is that if I start with a simple and I have an autom or an, yeah, an isomorphism of my simple, so here if X is simple, actually this should be, should be just a multiple of the identity, this map. So I will have use of notation and call it again the same. And this matrix, what we'll have is in the diagonal, maybe I should change this for, let me use the I notation that I was using, but later I might not use this, so X, J. So if the simples are isom yeah, are the same, if I and J are the same, I will have the twist, maybe let me call it the multiple, I will call it just theta I, this will be a non-zero complex number. And that's the thing that I will put in the diagonal of my matrix. This is a nice matrix, it's diagonal, has finite order by a theorem of Buffa. So all these twists numbers for the simples, they are root of unity, actually. So that give a lot of algebra, number, number theory methods that we can use. And now the S matrix, uh, and one thing about this, I, I describe it in that way, but could be also thought as if I'm tracing the, sorry, maybe let me let me talk about the twist for a minute only. So the twist, this twist thing can be also thought as if I'm tracing here, we'll need a normalization, but, and I will call this, this of I, it's a number, but I will be taking the trace of the number against, itself, the, the simple against itself. So it's the trace of this thing here. Maybe I should try to respect the notation. So that's the braid for me. And what I will do is I will trace it. 
So it's this uh, knot that I'm getting. And for the X, for the S matrix, the S matrix is measuring the degeneracy of my category. So what I will trace this time is the square of the braiding, as I was talking before that measures the non-degeneracy of my category. So I will trace And there is a dual here, but it's not very important. If an element is simple, the dual is also simple. So it's fine to do this. And basically what you have here is the, again, there is a normalization. This is the quantum dimension of an object. This is the dimension of the category. But what we are doing is we are looking into the Hof link. This one will be colored by Xi, but here we have Xj and Xi. I will have two colors. So these are some of the link invariants. So now I will tell you some examples very fast, and then I will tell you about setting. So one example is pointed modular categories, which is the example that Carlos was asking about. So back G, but now instead of having, I need to give it a braid and this braid need to be non-degenerate. So that braid is encoded by a non-degenerate quadratic form. And actually the, this is related with a abelian cycle. Because remember that I could have the associativity, the associativity is a three cycle. There is a bi-character associated to this if I want this to be braided and modular. And the result is that you can identify this or characterize this looking at non-degenerate quadratic forms on your group. The other way that we get modular categories or one way that we get is looking at doubles of finite groups. Again, I start with a finite group and a trico cycle and I construct a Hof algebra called the double that it's a Hof algebra that comes from looking at the group algebra and the dual of the group algebra, which is the algebra of functions over, maybe here I should be using C because I already settled on the complex. So functions from the group to the complex. And then you give this an, a structure of a Hof algebra. And that's the double of the group without the omega, the omega just change the associativity. Then there are some other nice categories that are called Fibonacci and Ising, and they are all examples of these quantum groups. Some nice things about Fibonacci is rank two. It has the unit and one other element, other simple, and the fusion rules are very simple, are actually coming from the Fibonacci sequence. So if you keep tensoring by, by tau, you will get the Fibonacci sequence when you look at the fusion rules. And the dimension of this is the golden radio. Other one is called Ising. In this one, I have that the dimensions of these objects are one, one, and square root of two. And the fusion rules are here get the one, here get one plus this, and this is fixed by this. And these all come from different quantum groups. The idea is that if I start with a simple Lie algebra, what I could do is I could look at the enveloping algebra, and then I can quantize. Here, this is for some roots of the unity. Uh, for some else, this, there are restrictions. This is not always modular or anything. And actually it doesn't end here. What I need to do is I need to look at the representations of these. But in principle, this category will not be exactly well behaved. It might have infinitely many simples. So what we will do is we will do something called a purification. We will only keep some uh, objects. We will quotient by the negligible uh, morphisms. So let me tell you the last ingredient before defining testing. I can define testing on, on fusion categories that have a grading. So what's a grading in a fusion category? The thing that I have, G is here, finite group. Sorry, maybe I should say finite group, or at least for me, will be a finite group. So what we will have is that C can be decomposed as a direct sum labeled by the group G. And the components in my direct sum are full abelian subcategories. 
So it's I putting I putting the symbols in different boxes, basically, each of them labeled by G. But now I want this to be compatible with my tensor product and with the product in the group. So what I will ask if is if I have something in the G component and something in the H and I tensor them, I want to land in the GH component. That's a great a grading. A grading is faithful. if none of these components is zero. I don't want trivial gradings. I want gradings with things in all of them. So some comments, the trivial component is always a fusion subcategory of C. And then the other thing is that all the categories admit a grading. Jelaki and Nikshik, they prove that there exists a universal grading group that faithfully grades C, and the trivial component is what it's called C add, the adjoint, and it's nice because you can compute it very easily. It's generated by the tensor product of the simples. But one comment is that this group could be trivial. So some, they are all faithfully graded, but sometimes it's the trivial group. So if you're in the trivial case, I will not be able to test anything, just a disclaimer. This is not always easier, easy to find, but if you're in the modular case, of, so when we're in the modular category, there is a theorem also by Jelak and Nikshik that this group of invertibles, sorry, that the universal grading group is isomorphic to the group of invertibles. So it's very easy to find in that case. So let me tell you the testing construction. I will tell you quickly what we will do. So the idea is that we will start with a G-graded premodular category. And what I want to do is I want to first test associativity. So if I started with an associate or, or test maybe, let me say fusion rules and associativities. So I will get a new tensor product and a new associativity constraint. That's what I will get in this first step. The second that I will also mention is just the braiding. And what we will do is we will test just this braiding. And the last one is test the twist or the premodular structure. So you see I'm getting all these new things. And the idea is that the output will be uh, something, I will do it like this, that it's a new uh, G-graded premodular category. So let me tell you the steps, but one disclaimer is not, not always if I start with modular, I will end with modular when I test, but we do know when. So we have a control under that. That's a comment. So I will not describe all the, the, the construction because I know that I'm running out of time. So I will, I will describe well the associativity testing and all the others are similar. So the idea is that we will start with a grading of the category. And this here is an abelian group because my category is braided. So what we want is to modify in an easy way the fusion rules to get a new fusion category. So what can I do? What I will do is I will use the old fusion rules. So here what I'm saying is that this element lives in the A component, this element lives in the B component. I'm using the old tensor product, but now I will twist it by an invertible. And this invertible only will depend on the graded components in which this element and this element lives. So it doesn't depend on the element, but depends on the grading. And this will be an invertible element in the trivial component. So this is an element that it's invertible and also lives in the trivial component. Okay, so uh, what I need to do now is I need to define the associativity. I will assume that just because it's easy that my original category was strict. So how I will define my associativity? What I want, I want a map that change parentheses in my new tensor category. So I will write all my diagrams are from top to bottom. And what I will write is for you this tensor product. I'm doing the new tensor product. So this piece is this. Now I will tensor by this. 
Sorry, I will, I will omit the tensor. But something important is now I want to write lambda, the invertible. Here is C because I'm tensoring by something in C, but I need to know where this lives. So let me go back one second back. This lives in CA, this lives in CB, and this lives in CE. So actually, the new tensor product lives still in CAB because this E that I'm adding here, it doesn't change anything because it's the neutral element in the group. So this just lives in AB. And I will do something similar. And now what I will do is as easy as I can. These two, I will just do it like this. I want to do this here. And so what I will do is I will use the braid that I have. So this will be the inverse of my old braid because my category was braided. That's what I, I'm using there. And now I need to define the associativity or I need to define something here. What I will use here It's um, some map that connects this and I will call lambda ABC. So lambda ABC, if you see, is a map <clears throat> that goes in this way. And what it's doing is giving me a two cycle condition on my lambda. So it's a two cycle condition. on this lambda that goes from a to a times a to the invertibles of the trivial component. So I have a two cycle condition and this other uh, map. And if you see, and I will not uh, write all the details, here is kind of the idea, the, uh, the pentagon axiom for this new tensor product and this new associativity will give you something like this involving these lambdas. And this will be like a three echo chain condition. So I will not, uh, go much over, but let me say some remarks. Some things don't change under testing. For example, the rank doesn't change because I haven't changed the simple objects. And the Frobenius Perron dimensions of the object or the category don't change. The grading, both uh, the grading group and the components also don't change, or maybe doesn't change. Because if you remember, uh, I'm using, and maybe here I should say something else, I will require here that my lambda is normalized. We will assume this. So what we are saying when we assume this is that nothing in the trivial component will change. So the grading doesn't change. One important thing that happened here is that there are obstructions to existence or obstructions to testing, to be able to test, and come from here. This here gives you an obstruction. You need this equality to be satisfied. So if this is not satisfied, I cannot test. I, I don't get a new fusion category. And this is a cohomology. It's a cohomology obstruction. And then associative testing forms a torsor, actually. Uh, so I will not go uh, much in detail over this, but it's a, a torsor over this <laughs> uh, once we choose a two cycle. And the last thing is I want to say is that it's, an, it's a, a particular case of a of nixic and Ostrich extension theory. But the big difference is that extension theory is very, very hard to compute while testing has some nice properties. And let me jump to the properties that I didn't get. So if you see, I was planning to say much more, but we have some nice properties. We can compute the new Muger center or, or symmetric center of the cested from the old one. 
and the testing data. And again, the same, we can compute the S and T matrix. I didn't tell you how I changed the braid and the, and the twist, but we can change the braid and the twist. And so we get this uh, from, uh, sorry, from the old S and T and the testing data. And actually we proved that the braid uh, group image is finite in the original category if and only if the braid group image is finite in the new, in the tested category. And why this is important? Uh, first of all, we compute the, braid, the new braid group image, but also this is called the property F and it's something very interesting for quantum information theory, for example. So I will stop here because I'm out of time, but thank you uh, for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. So I will stop the lib service in order that people uh, uh, are encouraged to 